Hello again, everybody. This is James Bartley, and you're watching and listening to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Today, my guests are Steve LaPlume and Larry Warren. And today, our subject will be everything you wanted to know about Rendlesham Forest, but were afraid to ask. And there are no two better people on this planet uh, to discuss these key issues than Steve and Larry. We've been having some combo problems, uh, Larry cutting in and out. But uh, we're going to try to bring Larry in to the conversation, and hopefully we'll have enough clear audio from his end to uh, really get some key input from Larry. So without any further ado, uh, Steve and Larry, welcome back to the Cosmic Switchboard Show. Thank you. Steve, you and I were talking uh, prior to recording here today about yeah. – your law enforcement background. Uh, you are essentially a security law enforcement officer. You come from a family, mm -hmm. uh, uh, from an extended family standpoint of people in law enforcement and uh, the military. So please tell our audience a bit about your law enforcement background and your family connections to it. Sure, sure. Well, when I growing up, um, my dad was a police officer. So Actually, I was ostracized quite a bit in the 60s because my dad was the fuzz or the heat or, you know, <laughs> he, he was a pig or, you know, they had all sorts of great names for cops back then, you know. So, uh, I, I mean, like in the 60s, I remember him coming home covered with uh, uh, tear gas and having to run upstairs and take showers because <laughs> tear gas blew back at him, you know, when they were doing all that sort of stuff. But, but eventually he ended up uh, chief of police and my sister joined the force right after uh, high school. So she ended up as a detective. My cousins and uncles growing up were all sheriff and deputies. So, so there was a big law enforcement background in my family. But uh, I actually, my whole high school career, I was geared up towards healthcare. I was going to be a nurse. I was planning on being a licensed practical nurse. So um, when the school got shut down, I didn't know what to do. And I thought, well, everybody else is a cop. I might as well be a cop. And my dad was in the Air Force, and I wanted to get out of the small town I was at, so I figured I'd join the Air Force and become a cop. So it just seemed like a natural thing to do, you know. So I, I just went in, but I, I didn't, I didn't really differentiate law enforcement from security. I just thought security was better. We got to carry some M16s, and I thought, you know, being a time at the 17-year-old kid that I was when I signed up and joined. I actually went in the service. I was 17. My parents had to sign for me. So uh, I graduated school. I was 17 years old. So, um, so yeah. So I just decided I'll just go in and do that. And you know, at least I have a job. The economy was horrible at the time, and you know, we had oil crisis going on, and Jimmy Carter was president. Things weren't the greatest. So, I figured at least I had a job for the next six years. And I signed up for six years instead of four, like normal, because. Uh, the recruiter was a really good talker, <laughs> but uh, but if you signed up for six, you got an extra strike. If we signed up on delayed em uh, enlistment, where the program was, you signed up right away, and then when you finished high school, when you got out of high school, when you got out of boot camp, that all counted as time and grade. So by the time I got out of high school and got out of boot camp, I almost had a year in service before I even stepped foot on my first base. So I already had a strike from that. So. We, uh, we both, I know Larry did the same thing as I did, and uh, we both got out with two stripes, and we were E3s, and thought that was a great thing, but when we got to our base, they didn't like E3s straight out of basic training, because these guys had to earn their stripes, so, <laughs> yeah, then we took a little heat from that, so. Uh, Earned them. Was there like, any degree of, like, slight hazing or something, or you had to... Uh, win your no, spurs no, in order to get I, the respect? No, I mean, I, I never even really, we didn't really have anything where they, I don't know, in, in the ganglands, they call it jumping you in or jumping you out of a gang. We didn't have any initiation really that I, you know, participated in. We weren't initiated or anything, but um, I think somebody mentioned to me at one point that, well, you guys got two stripes. How the hell that happened? <laughs> I <just> <laughs> think, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. The, the key thing about, Rendlesham that uh, people ought to realize is that as part of your job, attention to detail is uh, a key component of, of your activities. And we talked prior to the show about 
witness testimony, how infallible it is, how if there's a, a large number of witnesses or participants in an event, you separate them, you get their stories uh, individually. And uh, from your perspective, Steve, how has this, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, to be sure, but also from a professional mm -hmm. standpoint, how things could have been done, how things could have been improved upon, what's your take on how this investigation from the beginning well, has been conducted. Problem. You know what? Right off the bat, there wasn't an investigation. I, I can't speak from what happened to Larry and how that whole investigation went down, but with my sighting, my debriefing was my sergeant coming up to me going, hey, what'd you see out there? Oh, I saw this, that, and the other thing. All right, well, you missed the bus. You have to catch your bus back, you know, catch your own ride back to the barracks. That was my debriefing. There was no investigation. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, here we are in a NATO base, which... I have no idea, but supposedly we had nukes because I never got my security clearance, so I have no idea about any of that. But here we are on a, uh, you know, a very high-profile NATO base. A craft is over our base, and nobody's concerned with it. I mean, seems there should have been a whole lot of stink getting raised, you know? Yeah, at least the report I mean, so, filed or something. Something, yeah, and nothing. So, you know, and the same thing with Larry's situation. I never knew there was two two nights, three nights. All I knew that one day we heard some guys got chased by a UFO out in the forest and we laughed at them and it was pretty much swept under the rug. And that's the last I heard of it until I had my sighting about a month later. So that, I don't know what kind of investigation was done, but I didn't see anything, never heard anything, nothing. So, there seemed to be an awareness on the part of the, some members of the hierarchy that something was going on uh yeah. and i'd like your thoughts on not that we're in the mudslinging business not that we're in the casting aspersions business but just for the record from a historical military history perspective record one of the uh criticisms criticisms about Reynoldsham from people who really haven't studied the case is that oh you know a lot of these witnesses, they've changed their story over the years, but that, there are actually nuanced aspects to that. In, in Larry's case, he was told by F Larry Fawcett not to bring up the entities in the field meeting with Colonel Williams because it was too unbelievable for the time, right? And then there are others yeah. who we know, and based on my research and discussions with people like yourselves, that uh, there are some participants who experienced a lot more than they publicly let on. And wound up seemingly in a camp where they're it seems at times they're trying to uh, limit or uh, question the validity of others who've gone further out on the limb you know like what, what are your thoughts on that because j just what's come out from the, those people's own testimony in the past to certain researchers they've experienced a lot more than they're uh, they're letting on and then they're their topics of discussion veers off into binary numbers and, and all these strange things that seems to me to be a distraction. Yeah, I don't understand why people are holding their cards close to their chest like that. If you have an investigation, get all the information out there and let's see what's what. You know, I, I said a long time ago, why don't we get all the players together in one room, right? Because I'm a planner. That's what I do. I, I my, my career is all planning, construction jobs, multi-million dollar projects and stuff like that. So why don't we get everybody together and get a timeline and say, well, I was here and this is what happened to me. And from my perspective, you know, here's testimony A and then go to the next guy. But nobody's ever sat everybody down in the same room and hashed everything out. Everybody's got personality conflicts and egos get in the way. And like we I discussed earlier, all, all the Intel community had to do, if this had something to do with Intel or whatever, um, they just had to let us be us. Let everybody's ego get in the way. Let everybody's greed get in the way. Let their narcissistic personalities get in the way. Whatever. They, they didn't have to do much of anything, <laughs> you know. A little bit of, a little bit of pushing here and there, and we just devoured ourselves. It was easy for them, you know. And then, um, as far as witnesses and stuff, yeah, I mean, it, everybody's got a different point of view. Whether it's from an accident, but let's take combat. If I'm in combat, the guy next to me. I don't care if we're elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder. He's having a completely different experience than I am from his perspective. He might be peeing his pants because this is his first time in combat where I'm, you know, taking care of business because, you know, I've been doing it for two or three years. You know, so he's got a fear factor 
is really influencing his point of view that I don't have. So nothing's equal. You know, there's, there's absolutely nothing equal, you know? So, um, you know, I, I was reading something where, um, uh, Peniston said, well, I was doing this and that, and I completely lost track of John. And I don't know where he was for 45 minutes. So John's got a completely different perspective about what happened compared to Peniston, you know? So Jim and John got two different points of views. And um, when I talked with John uh, privately, he said, boy, I don't see how he went up there and he was writing stuff calmly in his notes. Because the first thing I remember is we hit the ground and we were scared shitless. Oh, am I allowed to swear? So, oh, but please, still, yeah. Okay. Please. <laughs> yeah, but that, that, that was his words. He said, we, we hit the ground and we were scared shitless. And he doesn't remember him going up to the craft or, or I'm, I don't believe I remember him saying that, but, but he, I do remember him saying they both hit the ground and they were scared to death. So what happened after that? I don't know, but that's from John's point of view. So his point of view, Henderson's point of view. I mean, everybody's got a different take on what's going on. Larry, Larry said that when he entered the forest, there was somebody that was uh, distraught and had his arm on his head like this, leaned up against a tree crying. I bet you that guy's got a completely different point of view and a completely different story than what Larry saw or anybody else that was there. So witness testimony is always kind of iffy. And then as new facts come out over the years, I mean, it's been 40 something years. So, um, I mean, even if you take 10 years after the fact, I never knew there was a second or a third night. I only knew of the first night and some guys got chased. I never knew there was a tape. I never knew any of that until Larry sicked on some Japanese news crew after me. <laughs> and they came to my house. I say he sicked them on me. He called me up prior. But uh, they came up to my house and they said, hey, here's a piece of paper. Would you mind reading it and give us your thoughts? And that was the, the, uh, the letter from Colonel Hall to the MOD. So that was the first time I saw that. And I didn't even realize whether that was pertaining to my sighting or whether it was pertaining to Larry's sighting, because I had no information, I had nothing, you know, I just saw a letter. Um, I, I probably could have looked at the date and figured it out, but I didn't at the time. And then they played a recording for me. Now, I've never heard that recording before. So all, all the information I got prior to that was zero. And then after that, I was able to draw some conclusions and go, oh, well, this makes a little sense now. No wonder everybody was doing this, that, and the other thing. If, you know, if, uh, if, you know, the colonel was out there and he's trying to debunk it and they've got radiation and this and that, they actually had somewhat of an investigation compared to what I thought, which was absolutely zero. So, you know, years later, I can, you know, come up with a couple different things like, oh, well, that's why this happened and that happened, maybe connect a few dots. But I don't think people's stories changed completely. I think they just got altered based off of new facts and what was going on and talking to people and new people coming out of the woodwork. And, you know, some people coming out with just all total BS lies. Some people coming out with truths that, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying it. I, I know my story hasn't changed because I've just said my story was my story from the first time, um, I think it was 1983 when Larry and I went to a MUFON meeting out, out in Springfield. Same thing I spewed out then is the same thing I spewed in my book. It wasn't what it was. I never changed anything. So, you know, and that's why um, I dedicated chapter six to Larry, because when Larry came in my room and he told me what happened to him, that was the cleanest, most recent um, dialogue from Larry to anybody about what happened that was basically, I don't know how to say on record. You know, he came to me and said, hey, here's what happened to me firsthand. So, I mean, what's, what changed in his story? Thanks. He told me about he told me about three guys in a snowsuit looking thing. He told me about the colonel who slipped in the mud and you laughed at him. Uh, <laughs> right, Larry? <laughs> you can confirm all that, right? Same story, same thing. And... You know, Larry and I might have had our differences over the years, banging heads, this and that. But, uh, you know, it was the 80s and we're all pretty inebriated back then. So I guess we got to forgive ourselves for our shortcomings when it comes to life getting in the way. <laughs> you know, so. Can uh, you Larry's hear me? To say, oh, I can hear yeah, you now. Nothing. So go ahead. Keep talking. 
I never changed my story either. And I keep saying that I did. I did not. If you heard that. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we heard it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I could hear you. Yeah. You know, I'm going to bring up something interesting about Larry's Larry's story here, too. He talks about three beings that looked like they were in skin-tight snowsuits and how they just kind of floated from point A to point B. If you go and read the book Trinity that just came out by Paula Harris and um, Jacques Vallée, the witnesses prior to Roswell said that these were two, two young kids. They came to the crash site, and what they saw were three beings in skin-tight suits seemingly floating through the craft. So you tell me. <laughs> these, this it's is something like 19... This is something from like 1944 or some whenever this incident happened in Trinity that uh, that they wrote this book about. So here we are, you know, 50 something years later and we have our incident or 40 something years later, we have our incident. Larry has an incident and he's seeing the exact same thing with the exact same type of beings acting the exact same way. I don't know. I guess it's a coincidence. Could be swamp gas, right? Well, it's been backed up by many alien abductees over the years who've described beings floating towards them or hanging suspended in air. And when they've been on board the craft, uh, similar dynamic. These beings, some of them, they just float around and scoot along yeah. almost on an invisible escalator. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. The One of the things that, that came up, and this was all complicated because of the, the traumatizing nature of the events, because – from my readings of Reynolds Shima, a lot of the uh, reported phenomena uh, in the UFO field, in the abduction field, was present in Reynolds Shima Forest. The spheres, the glowing balls of light, the craft that uh, come up, you know, dissemble into different parts and fly in different directions and the nuclear aspect. Mm -hmm. So Reynolds Shima seemed to have it all in, in many ways. And the traumatic nature of it, yes, it, it people are going to have different memories and some people are going to be so shut down emotionally. They don't want to even bring it up uh, to themselves, yeah. let alone others. Uh, and there was definitely a missing time element. Uh, Steve, we talked about this uh, um, on the show, you and I, and I, I know you discussed it with Larry and Another aspect of this case is a lot of key information seems to be uh, have been memory hold. I mean, it's available. It's out there. It's been published, but it, it's not um, emphasized. Like, for example, mm -hmm. I was just flipping through, um, you know, a book, and then I, I came across an account from Adrian Bastinza. And Bastinza was talking about how he and Burroughs came back to the staging area. And uh, Halt started berating them for being gone for 30 or 40 minutes. And from uh, Bastinza and Burroughs' perspective, they were hit by a blinding light. They were immobilized, and, and they thought the whole thing only lasted two or three minutes. Turns out they were mm. gone for 40 minutes. So that's another example yeah. of missing time. So, again, a lot of those elements, the, the, the spheres, the, the glowing orbs, the missing time, uh, you know, did you want to uh, uh, comment on that? Because there seems to have been an alien abduction element to this as well. Yeah, and you know, this that's one thing that always kind of bugged me. And and I want to say something. I always say this and preface it with I'm trying I'm not trying to brag, but I get a really high IQ and I get a I'm kind of a freak in nature. <laughs> Along with my IQ, I, I'm a INFJ personality if it comes to that Myers and Briggs. So like one percent of the people have my personality. But um I've got a, a memory thing. I, I don't even know how to describe it, but I remember things in great detail. I remember things from when I was a kid every day. My daughter would say, hey, dad, roll, roll a video in your head. And you remember when we did this, that, and the other thing? And I'll be able to tell what everybody was wearing in the situation. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. It's like I got a constant video going on and stuff like that. So seeing the craft and seeing it over me, okay, that's that's a heck of an experience. But then the craft was here, and then the craft was there. And from here to there, I don't remember. And that bugs the living crap out of me. Because I should remember, it went from a craft, a structured crash, uh, excuse me, a, a structured craft to a ball of light over to the right that was ascending up into the sky. So how to get from point A to point B? You know, I've never had any uh, reoccurring alien dreams. I've had one dream that bugged me, and I, I've only had it twice. But 
it was like me ascending to heaven, but it wasn't, I don't know, I didn't think it was alien. I thought it was demonic. It was just a weird dream, but I've never had anything, uh, you know, any flashbacks or anything or anything that would indicate I was abducted or anything like that. So I don't know. Maybe I'll find out one day. <laughs> but but it's, but it's always bugged me that I can't remember that a couple of seconds in time. So and and I still don't remember why I was late getting back to the base that morning. You mean uh, following the night's events? Yeah, yeah. They posted me on the east gate. Normally, we close the gate, and I'd go do bathroom breaks and food breaks for everybody because I wasn't a qualified law enforcement. So, uh, basically, I, I was a redheaded stepchild. I was security with no clearance. So they put me on law enforcement, but I wasn't law enforcement qualified, so I really couldn't do much. So I'd either stand at the gate and give people bathroom breaks and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I was I was actually kind of in a sweet spot there because I had no responsibility for a while. <laughs> so it wasn't too bad. But um, I don't know. So I got off on a chain. I, I, I kind of forgot. Oh, yeah, but that. you mentioned that, uh, you know, you wound up somewhere the next morning. and um... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so I was on the East Gate. And they put me there for the whole night, just to keep an eye on things in case something else happened. And then uh, after we had our second sighting and I was on the gate all night, I remember the next morning I got to the, because you know, we were at Woodbridge, and normally we get collected and they drive us back to, uh, to Bentwaters. But for some reason, I was late getting back. And for the life of me, I can't remember why we were late getting back that morning. Oh, yeah. we, you mean uh, you and the troop that you were with? Whoever, whoever drove me there, yeah. And I, oh. I, I, for some reason, I just, that's what really bugs me is I have a block. I don't remember driving back there. I remember getting dropped off, but I don't remember who drove me. And it should have been, it should have been, uh, it should have been probably Palmer. He had the vehicle at the time, so. Because usually I drove back with law enforcement. I didn't, I didn't drive back on the bus with everybody else. So, and yeah. how much time are, are we trying to account for here? Um, from the time I was relieved to, I don't know, what did it take? Larry might be able to tell you five, 10 minutes to get back to the, from one base to the other. But by the That's... time I got there, the bus had already left. So I, I think I was an hour late on getting back, maybe somewhere around there. So, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I do remember that we had an incident one night where we found some blood over near the school, and it was because somebody had a nosebleed the day before, but it, it was looked like fresh blood. And I'm thinking maybe they pulled me off the gate to go help investigate that that morning, but for some reason, the timing doesn't seem right in my head. I don't know why they would have pulled me off to do that, because I, I had nothing to do with that the night before, so I don't know. It, it's just there's just something there that just ain't right. So, yeah. Larry, do you want to chime in? Hear me? Can you hear me? Getting from the forest back to central security control. I, I I tried to fill that in in my head. I have no memory of how I got from the woods back to sun, and the sun was coming up. And the time doesn't make sense. And Burroughs and I talked about that. Uh, the same kind of miss. It, there was this missing memory there. Just that period, just gone. I can't. Mm -hmm. I can remember all. Remember going back, getting back. You know, and there was the effects of what we had been in front of. However. Zero memory. What took me back? How I got there? In what? You know, and I, I don't know. I think I've tried to fill that in when I was doing the book years ago, but I really don't remember it. Oh, hell with that detail. But once, once I spoke to John Burroughs over here in England, yeah, we said. On duty. That's why it was three nights, not four. It was three. You know what? And I have to say that because it isn't th four nights. And uh, he said, "You know, funny. I don't remember. We didn't remember anything getting back. 
No. And and I, I know I, I can wonder. Oh, go ahead. You know, I get somebody at the door. Hang on just a sec. Folks, my uh, the audio here is very weird today. Yeah. Are you? Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Oh, uh, please. Uh, so, I guess somebody here buying some livestock. <laughs> so my daughter's <laughs> taking care of it. <laughs> so, but um, yeah. As far as the missing time thing goes, yeah, that's always always kind of bugged me. And you know, I I got to kind of wonder too. Um. You know, sometimes when people have traumatic events, they they block out time too. It, it might not be missing time. Aliens took us. It might be missing time. I I just block that out because I know uh, um, when I was over in uh, China, I lived over there, and I took my family to Thailand in 2003 for vacation, and we got in the middle of that tsunami, and um, my kids just completely blocked out. They don't remember any of it. You know, my wife, she wasn't affected that much for whatever reason. But uh, for me, uh, just blew my mind. And like, if I, if we keep talking about it, I'll, I'll start crying and blubber like a baby. So, I mean, it just really affected me, you know. So, I mean, we were talking before about different perspectives and stuff like that, you know. And my youngest daughter, she doesn't remember a thing. My oldest daughter, she's like, yeah, I kind of remember being helpless and wanting to help people and I couldn't do anything. So, you know, I mean, she had that memory. But and I think that's why she's an ICU nurse right now. <laughs> so I think that has something to do with it. But uh, but yeah, just different people's perspectives and stuff. You know, I, I mean, yeah. and the trauma um, aspect of it too. Which yeah. I mean, you know, motor vehicle accident victims, survivors. Uh, there's that memory loss uh, after uh, oh, the yeah. accident. And yeah, I, I I've crashed my I race super bikes. I've crashed my motorcycle so many times that I finally got used to keeping my eyes open and trying to trying to control the crash and control what I'm doing. So I'm not breaking arms and legs and fingers and stuff, but it takes a time or two because you're scared to death and you don't know what's going on. And, but after it's kind of weird. You get used to crashing after a while because you do it so much. <laughs> so, so, um, but at first it, you're in a tunnel vision type of scenario, you know, trying to save your own life, everything goes slow motion, but then, Later on, as you kind of get used to it, you don't have that tunnel vision so much. You're able to do things. It's like I said before, in combat, you're able to function a lot better than somebody that's just getting there, that's a newbie, you know? Same thing when you're in a crash. I know um, I've been in accidents with my daughters where they went, just before the crash, everything went black, where I'd be like, oh, I actually saw us hitting the car and saw the taillights exploding, you know, when I rear ended somebody once, you know? So my perspective, of, there's their eyes shut down instantly where I didn't. But I'd been crashing motorcycles for years, so you know, so I had more experience. It wasn't as traumatic, I guess. I, I don't know. It's just different, different uh, experience level, I guess. So everybody's got a different perspective. Everybody, you know, we talked about that already. You know, no sense beating a dead horse, but for sure, everybody's going to have a different perspective and a different view of what's going on. So. And I was looking at. Oh, go ahead, Larry. You're going to say something. A lot of intelligence community on that base after and then steve's incidents later a few weeks after but uh we had a lot and it wasn't afosi it was cia and nsa they always minimalize it and say it was osi it was not them at all and i still see researchers that should know better unless they just don't listen to anything we say that went through it say AFOSI, you know, it's just always the script they go on. They, they can't help themselves. If you hear music, there's street fests going on because there's some very bad singing going on coming through my window. So forgive them and me and King Charles. <laughs> oh, that. yeah, King Charles. He was coronated yesterday, wasn't he? So they they have street festivals now or uh, things, and they have a stage down the street, and I can, and the music's blasting in for that house, and whoever's singing is not very good. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> oh. 
it, it's like living near a border town like Tijuana. It's like just Wednesday morning at 3 a.m. It's just the tremendously loud uh, music. Uh, lots of intelligence, black ops, skullduggery at Rendlesham in the aftermath. And what I always wondered was, to be sure, there's going to be an element of people just because of uh, the trauma, whatever the case may be, they're just going to naturally black out uh, a lot of the events associated with, with Rendlesham because um, as Jenny Randall's talked about, there was definitely an Oz factor to the nature of the events there. There was uh, a slowing down of time factor for the participants in the field where their, their shadows were not walking in sync with their, their bodies and, you know, odd stuff like that. And, and the, again, the, the orbs and, and the things going on in the forest. So when people find themselves in that kind of, literally for that point in time, an alien environment, <clears throat> sometimes physics as we understand it kind of goes pear-shaped a little bit. So that's going to uh, affect the uh, the memory of, of people whose brain waves are, are momentarily being altered by whatever energy fields, what, what have you. <clears throat> you were in the presence of a landed craft. There was that odd yellow mist thing in, in like a, a certain geometrical pattern. So odd things were going on. It, it seems to me from the outside looking in, but also being familiar with how deep black military operates in, in an ET uh, context, it's quite possible that some degree of uh, selective memory amnesia, uh, memory erasure was uh, put onto the various, some of the witnesses. And we're, what makes me wonder is where does the, alien abduction missing time slash you know abduction thing where does that end and the military psychologist stepping in and doing their uh you know jedi tricks right because by this point in time uh december 1980 the military would have known the drill of what to do in these mass ufo events how to quickly hypnotize and mind control people and so just from what I'm hearing from, in your case, uh, uh, Steve, and, and in your case, Larry, and then also some of the others, there definitely seems to be uh, memory tampering uh, uh, in, in a number of these cases. And what I'd like to know, Larry, is, again, different accounts, not necessarily from you, but attributed to you, and I, hopefully you come clear in this audio, uh, you know, just to set the record straight, in, in, in Gary's recent book, <clears throat> he talked about when you were taken onto the uh, the car <clears throat> uh, and, and taken underground for that whole debriefing scenario, uh, the people in the car were described almost as, as oriental looking or, or Chinese looking. Was that what you recall or was that what somebody else said? We're... Uh... If you can hear me, they were uh, like agent type people, like oh, a fed. Agent. Oh, an agent rather than Asian. Okay, sorry. I must not have heard that correctly. Thanks for setting that straight. I have seen that men in black and all that just were suited people with New York plate on that car. Steve will know about that. And with, they sprayed us, me and Bastinza. But I think that was wing intelligence we went to. I think that stuff was played around in our head. But what I saw in that field was not put in my head. Evidence that's still there. But no, they, 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 you know, the UFO types try to, you know, they make even worse. They make it more. and then Sensationalized. Pay for it for the rest of your life. Why anyone would bother all these years. But... You know, like Steve, Steve is the second after me RFI fella, you know, because he is part of it. He is part of that window and all uh, to speak ever. And then he just got on with his uh, very untamed life. And, you know, and I went my way. He kept family are from Mass, Massachusetts. And uh, we had a lot of common ground. You know, he came to my wedding first time. But uh, 
it affected him very different than me. I just went insane and just kept, the more evidence came out, I found the enemy was the government, like Steve said, don't have to do a thing. It's all set. And the UFO, UFO community will do it. They'll lock you up. They'll they'll take you down. We, James, and I have nothing to sell that bunch, so I don't care if they know I'm saying it at all. Treacherous bunch. There's a lot of good people that have been through things, but in general, it draws in some treacherous people. Never seen them like it in my life. Internet. The end. <laughs> Well, that, that adds to the, the confusion and uh, increases the, the noise, the signal ratio. And what I've always been striving for all these years is just to get clarity on the subject because we're talking about a mega event, landed craft, occupants alight from the craft, meet base personnel, including the, the, the wing commander who later becomes a general. That's a big deal by any standards. That Just that fact alone makes Rendlesham in a class by itself. And then the instructive aspect to it, how equal parts almost ET security precautions with a missing time memory erasure thing, and then also the deep black spook security aspect where this well-greased, well-oiled mechanism kicks into gear. Oh, we got one of these mass military cases again. And Time and again, you hear from all these different people, missing time, uh, you know, location displacement. I was here one moment, I was here another. There, there seems to have been that element as well. Now, did you notice, as has happened in other cases and in other bases around the world, uh, a, a dispersal of personnel after this event where people, you know, shunted hither, thither, and yon? Well, I can tell you... Um... Myself, Larry, Mark Thompson, um, and maybe a couple others, we had negative reaction and we were out of the service pretty quick. Um, I don't know, I don't know whatever happened to Mark Thompson, but I know he was involved somehow because he had talked with me about it. And after we uh, left the service, we actually left Ben Waters on the same day, same flight. He came to my house, stayed overnight, and I put him on a bus and sent him back to uh, Santa Cruz, California, where he was from. But uh, yeah, he he confirmed what Larry said, and uh, he confirmed that they're having trouble with the light alls getting them to work, um, a bunch of stuff like that. But I don't know whatever happened to him. All I know is his mother was a realtor in Santa Cruz, and his brother was a guitarist in a band called Rat until he became a Christian. Then he quit the band. So if anybody wants to track Mark Thompson down or Thomas, was it Thomas or Thompson? I think it was Thompson. I don't remember, but uh. Yeah, there'd be somebody that probably be interested to speak to. You know, um, as far as the intel, as far as the intel people, you know, I I saw what I saw, and I never mentioned anything to anybody. <laughs> Excuse me, I might have mentioned something on the phone to my parents, but uh, I really didn't say a whole lot. I wasn't very vocal about it, and I still found I had two people tailing me around the base. And I confronted him. I wrote about that in my book, how I confronted him with stuff. And uh, why would they be following me? I wasn't causing any trouble. I wasn't writing letters to him like Larry was. I wasn't being vocal or anything like that. So I don't know if they were just seeing what I was up to or seeing if there was an effect on me. I don't know. But I definitely caught these guys tailing me a couple different times and confronted them. So. Remember when that happened to you. Sure I do. Yeah. yeah. I can remember you and me. And see, people, we, we, we were there. That's the difference. It's like being, you're in the Beatles. Not. And, the, and and you can speculate. What's it like to be a Beatle? Well, this wasn't as rock and roll, but people, yeah. it must be gets it. But we were there. I remember you and me sitting in the club saying, what the F, you know, and and, yeah. and shuttle launched that day, the very first space shuttle. And I on the TV and I and we were on those red, we were back in that lounge. Yeah. And I, I 
all that stuff, man. And, uh, you know, Worldwide and Henderson. <laughs> yeah. Hear me, folks, I'm sorry with my phone here. I found a piece of paper I will photograph and send to you, Steve. And it shows all the players in our rank getting moved to a new training status. Social security numbers and everything. So I won't put that out anywhere because I yeah. stole records. <laughs> everything. But obviously I won't put that out anywhere anybody but i will send that to you hmm. interesting okay do you recall Back. larry uh, larry do you recall seeing mark thompson or thomas at the uh, uh cable green site or were you were just too preoccupied with what was going on in front of you to, to notice if it was there or not I went out with him in the pickup truck oh you went out with him in the pickup truck that precipitated the whole event were pulling light off and he was one of the troops in the back of the uh, truck I, I was taken off my post it was an alert going on an alert and they tried to say there wasn't but we'd, we'd there had already been two evenings of UFO incidents I didn't know that I did in fact when that guy so, okay, it was big tall guy, his hair like mm -hmm. a surfer type yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. And Steve are East Coast guys, right? And I know, James, you were a California. And because um, I, I met James, Steve, over 30 years ago in San Diego. I was mean, so way back. Mm. Um, yes, I remember him. And I remember he, he, he tripped out real quick right after it all. Everyone, I was put into operations and supply. You know, you're not going to argue with them, but I was still a cop by and all that kind of thing. And, uh, but they kept eyes on us. That's for sure. That's a hundred percent. I saw when Lieutenant Tamplin had her flipped out in Carl Drury's office, Major Drury. I didn't know what it was about, but I remember it well. I remember it to this day. And I wrote about it in the book I did, if, mm -hmm. if anyone remembers. <laughs> I wrote, wrote it with, shouldn't have, but uh, this is hard. Yeah, I remember all these little things. How could we forget? I'll shut up now. Uh, no, this is, uh, oh, oh, please continue. Uh, I was going to say, well, no, it brings up a good point. People don't understand the day-to-day -day activities going on and very oppressive feeling. I mean, maybe Larry can confirm this, but boy, that base, it, it just had a negative vibe to it. I, I had a friend of mine that I joined the Air Force with. We went in on the buddy system and he was assigned over in Germany and he, he, he did a TDY over to... Uh, to Bentwaters because he worked on A-10s on the electronics. And uh, um, a year or so later, after I'd gotten out, he was home on leave. And uh, we went out for a job. We were on a cross-country team together in high school. So we we went out and we were running the old cross-country course, talking and stuff. And he said, boy, he said, I went to that base. He goes, I can see why you wanted to get off. He goes, that's the worst base I've ever been on in my life. <laughs> so, so, I mean, there was definitely a negative, oppressive feeling on that base for whatever reason. I don't know why, but he said he felt it too. He couldn't wait to get out of there. So, just the know. negative vibe. Morning, oh. morning. I got off the bus, and Bud Steffens, who was involved in night one, picked me up. He said, "Man, this place isn't what I thought it would be at all." And Bentwaters was considered a remote assignment, believe it or not. Even though it was 80 miles, it's considered a remote hardship assignment in the Air Force. I didn't. And uh, there was nothing to do around that place at all, even off base. It was The base was the only thing. And there's still yeah. nothing to do. To, you know, Suffolk, you know, it's, it's, you know, quiet country folks, you know. And, uh, but there was a bad heaviness, a vibe. 
and uh, you know, it was my first base and Steve's, but I, I wasn't impressed. I wasn't impressed mm -hmm. at all. There's a lot of other things with officers, wives that they try to get up to and all kinds. We could do a whole dynasty TV series on that behavior. And, you know, so all these oh. people would rap. Oh, they, they must know, you know, be more respectful because they have a colonel thing or they captain. Well, I, I, I was young, but man, I saw some things go on there, man, that I, I still get, remember. I get I guess some friends of mine entangled with some officers' wives. <laughs> yeah. Uh, enlisted men? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah, when the officers are away, the wives will play. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. Yeah, I never got into any of that, but yeah. Yeah, I have some friends of mine telling me some tales. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, but I'll tell you, Man, I tell you, and the, and then that obviously the incident happens, the incidents, and um, you know they they're very busy. These researchers talking about precursor events that happened a year before, two years before. Steve is part of that stretch of the Rendlesham Forest incident, and it is that period, not just the three nights, but up to another week or two late, later. It's in that window that makes up what it is you can't have a million of these things it was right part of that and uh and connected to it you know seeing a light somewhere does not match what we saw what steve saw what i saw it's not a bug on the glass it's way more than a light you know so you people involved in this thing they've got to earn it man we've earned it but other people you know when it's all safe they want to come out and think this is all fun and you're on these things, you're in a TV show or a movie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking. And uh, it ain't, you know. You know, I do it to try to reach witnesses. He was laughing because I've, I've never been out to be the most popular uh, fellow with these types at all, no. Yeah. I do it as long as it is misrepresented and I'm alive, I'll stick around correcting the record, at least mine. I never changed anything, anything. And if anyone had told me to, I would have told them to know me well enough. I'm a nice guy, but man, I, I learned what these people are all about, the UFO group types and some big thing and these people couldn't have lived through these kind of things. I know now, I go, no way could they have walked in our shoes at that time, especially when we were young guys. And yeah. we signed up not long after Saigon fell, really. And it wasn't popular to do. And we chose to serve men, you know. We didn't just want to, hey, let's do something. We chose to serve. These people serve tea. And yet they pass self-aggrandizing judgments on people like us. And without us, they wouldn't be. Well, well, that's the irony, because you guys were security specialists. You were trained observers guarding, unbeknownst to yourselves, at least initially, a, a NATO nuclear, tactical nuclear base. So, And then also the fact that it was considered a, a hardship case, it just makes me wonder if what the turnover rate was over there just how many people completely oblivious to the ufo stuff just had enough of the base and opted out if they had the means to do so uh, it, it's one of those things and uh, what i wanted uh, to hear from both of you also uh, larry and steve was if memory serves bastinza says that he was injected when he was taken underground we know peniston said that and then uh, how about from your perspective, Larry? Were, were you injected when you were taken down there? Uh, you, no, no, where they sprayed you, right? Uh, but then what happened? When did you start to come to consciousness uh, along this experience? On a, a clinical setting with an IV. And uh, 
know it wasn't four nights because I remember where I was on New Year's Eve. But I'll tell you, I was missing I, I for like uh, me and some others for a good 24 hours. And uh, they said some of us were on emergency leave or some kind of, but I was just dazed when I come out, you know. But I, I called my mother within hours of it. I On the pay phone near the chow hall, Steve will remember it, the English phone thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that afternoon, that's when we got called a note up from the day room to go out to the parking lot near the new construction. And that's where these, aer it was aerosol that just, I could hear, but I couldn't move. And that happened. She didn't. I think they meddled. They took us. I was regressed about this. You think of hypnosis uh, by Bud Hopkins many years ago, but I trusted Bud. And a lot of names came up in that uh, clinical setting. And audio tape a regression. If he wanted that, he did everything to get it, and he did get it. You know who gave it to him? Who? Author. Because he had access to all of Bud's work. Okay, this tape was a recording of your hypnotic regression. And I was liberating you for a moment there. Did you say Colonel Halt or or who got the hold of that cassette, courtesy of Peter Robbins? Halt. Halt. Oh, it's Colonel Halt, huh? I named, named six names that were there in that clinical thing. I don't remember. And that tape was given to Charles Holt. He wanted it, and he got it. And Peter was the, the source. He was the cutout that gave. And Peter didn't make a, as far as you know, he didn't make a copy for himself, certainly not for you. Uh, he, he, he might have, have custody of these tapes. Uh, Peter used to record phone calls with me, all kind of weirdness. And we all know what's happened with him years ago. But there was, you know, he wrote in the book, if someone put a word in my ear, I'm out of here. Uh, yeah, he facilitated. The bathroom break. Oh, sure. Halt was Leslie Keen, that uh, researcher, New York Times. But uh, uh, he helped facilitate getting that tape from Bud's house. In David Jacobs was involved in that, too. And they're supposed to have a code of conduct, but they clearly didn't read that chapter. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I've got things <laughs> to say about David Jacobs. I'll say for, say for another time, just from the alien abduction, my lab perspective, right? Uh, well, I'll, I'll just say part of it that a gal that I worked with that I knew for a fact was a military abductee, i.e. alien abductee, but also occasionally kidnapped by the military and drugged and done things to, that David was well aware of that aspect of her story, but kept shifting the emphasis away. And not only that, though, but every time this particular uh, abductee and others that I'd spoken to talked about reptilians, Jacob's would always say that, that what they're really looking at was a hybrid that looked like a reptilian, but wasn't. So, uh, you know, I've had red flags. And he's wrote the book that a lot of service level type researchers point to. Oh, the threat. He was trying to warn us. <clears throat> well, he warned us, but it was a limited hangout. There's a lot more going on than what he described. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this out was because, and I'm telling you, my mind is blown. I I. <laughs> What you just said about the missing tape, I'd, I'd never heard of that. So, uh, and the fact that you identified six other personnel, please. I don't want you to know about that. They don't want, they, these are underhanded folks. 
Now, I was naive, and you don't think people that close to you are on some kind of agenda trip. Unfortunately, I spent 30 years with somebody that was definitely working under me all the way, all the way. Undermining, and that, that's what people have to understand. See, for people like us, you, you guys are from that era. Uh, I, I'm a student of Cold War spy, counter spy uh, history. So I, I took that into the whole UFO field. I was already familiar with a lot of that, the great spy cases, double agents and moles and what have you. So I understand the concept of betrayal and, and the, uh, the concept of infiltration of targeted intelligence uh, agencies. In this case, the, the targeted intelligence agencies were witnesses to, you know, to the Rendlesham experience. And because you were the most vocal and outspoken of what had happened, Larry, and this is what these surface level truthers and these Tic Tac newbies, they don't even want to delve in, in this direction. How the powers that be will go to the trouble of literally assigning people to undermine your life in various ways. And you know, the aforementioned wasn't the only one. Uh, I'm absolutely convinced Russ Estes was absolutely sent into your life for a period of time as fate would have it. I was just watching once again uh, the, U the KGB UFO files. I forget which episode it was, but there was in silhouette a guy who identified himself as a defense intelligence agent involved in UFO related matters. And I'm telling you from the, the silhouette uh, the, the tone of voice, even though they kind of electronically altered it, <laughs> it looked like Russ Estes to me, right? And so I'm just thinking, and we know of Russ Estes' uh, Army Security Agency, NSA background, et cetera, et cetera. Point being is that at that point in time, late December 1980, Cold War is starting to heat up in many ways. All kinds of things were going on. The security apparatus for these types of events, alien military interactions, it kicked into high gear, man. I'm telling you. And it kicked into high gear and then they tracked you guys when, when you went off in the civilian life and then they just set things in motion. Uh, one quick point I want to make about the alien abduction uh, aspect too, of just how controlled the information is. I'm not going to mention names, but certain well-known uh, head of abduction research, let's say, in, in MUFON, had collated lots of personal information, thousands of personal uh, details about alien abductees that had been uh, in, uh, interviewed and hypnotically regressed. And then that all that data was magically leaked over to a National Institute of Discovery Sciences, NIDS, which many consider to be a, a CIA front. So, you know, a major organization like MUFON would have such a horrific security breakdown that all this personal data would just be shifted over. And see, that's how the UFO research community has always been. 